Hi, I'm Matt Tarr. I'm an avid organic gardener and I work as a state wildlife specialist for the University of New Hampshire Cooperative Extension. The following presentation highlights the non-chemical, the herbicide-free approach I use to nearly completely eradicate Japanese knotweed from my yard. In this presentation, I show you each of the steps, the trials and tribulations I experienced during this project. My intent here is to highlight one way that Japanese knotweed invasions can be controlled without chemicals and to provide some tips to help you succeed if you try this method for controlling knotweed. In November 2017, my wife and I purchased a 0.8 acre property in Gilmington Ironworks, New Hampshire. This property was a blank slate that I intended to convert into a small organic suburban homestead where we could grow much of our own food. To accomplish that goal, one major challenge I needed to address was this 70 by 100 foot area that was completely invaded with Japanese knotweed. This was a significant area of our 0.6 acre backyard and I wanted to use this area to grow vegetables, fruiting shrubs and wildflowers. But to do so, I knew I first needed to completely eradicate this knotweed. So before I go further, I just want to direct your attention to a really great document written by Doug Saigan, the Invasive Species Coordinator with the New Hampshire Department of Agriculture, Markets, and Food. In this publication, Doug provides an excellent overview of the biology and how to identify Japanese knotweed. Doug also provides detailed information for some of the most effective ways he's found for controlling knotweed. In most situations, chemical control using an herbicide is often the most cost-effective method for controlling knotweed. But because I was trying to establish a completely organic homestead, I wanted to try every other possible approach before resorting to herbicides. So the following slideshow shows you my nearly three-year herbicide-free battle to get this plant under control. Almost immediately after purchasing the property, I started to cut and pile all of the above ground knotweed canes. I've found that these dried canes are very unlikely to sprout, but the seeds do have the potential to germinate. You definitely wouldn't want to move these dried canes off site. And in fact, in New Hampshire, it would be illegal to do so. I left the piles in place during the winter because there was a large flock of dark-eyed juncos and white-throated sparrows that were using the standing knotweed as cover. The birds used these piles all winter and regularly used them as overnight cover. I burned the piles in place at the beginning of the spring 2018 growing season. And of course, the knotweed was one of the first plants to emerge very early the next spring. So here's what most of the area looked like when I started to experiment with a variety of non-chemical methods to control the knotweed in 2018. I first experimented digging out the knotweed roots, called rhizomes. On hands and knees, I sifted through the dug soil for all visible pieces of rhizomes. I learned through this process that this plant can sprout from very tiny rhizome fragments that are very easy to miss. After getting the soil as clean as possible, I planted wildflowers here on the right, and in the trench where the black tub is, I planted potatoes, mainly because I wanted to see if I could get other plants to fill these areas in to help discourage the knotweed from growing back. So here's just one pile of the rhizomes that came out of that area of the trench and the little area of wildflowers to the right of the trench. I learned through this process that trying to dig out the rhizomes by hand was completely ineffectual for reducing the growth of this knotweed invasion. We tried using the knotweed as a food crop by harvesting the tender shoots. They were okay just sauteed in butter, but they were a little too lemony for my taste. Knotweed tastes a bit like rhubarb, so they're actually super tasty in strawberry knotweed pie. I tried to pickle some, but it just came out really mushy and it was totally unappetizing. And we pretty much quickly realized that we could not possibly eat enough knotweed to keep up with how quickly it grew. So during summer 2018, I never let the knotweed grow more than about ankle high. Basically, as soon as it grew a full set of leaves, I used a weed whacker to cut it back flush with the ground. My thought was that if I could continuously cause the plant to sprout new growth, I would drain the energy reserves from the roots and slow it down. This yellow line shows where the knotweed actually crossed over into my neighbor's property. 
and thankfully they were fully on board with my trying to get this plant under control. If I wasn't able to also control the knotweed on their property, there would be no real way for me to gain control of this invasion because this is just one huge plant connected by a dense network of underground rhizomes. I even tried grazing a flock of laying hens in the knotweed. I thought that the hens might help to kill the leaves as soon as they emerge, but the chickens wouldn't eat it. This is what the site looked like within less than two weeks after I cut it each time. Those are the flowers I planted in the lower left corner of the photo. They were completely overrun with knotweed and the potato plants barely emerged above the ground. By late August, I was burning the knotweed each week with a weed dragon, which is basically a handheld propane flamethrower. I did this mainly because it was a little bit more fun than weed whacking. And although the knotweed did seem to sprout back a bit slower, it seemed to sprout denser in response to burning compared to cutting. So trying to control knotweed using all of these different methods took up about all of the free time I had available for working in my yard in 2018. And none of the methods seemed to have any tangible effect on slowing its growth. By September, I concluded that the only way I was going to control the knotweed without chemicals was to smother the entire area. Doug Sagan was kind enough to pay me a visit and we decided that the best approach would be to install a permanent weed barrier and to build soil on top of the weed barrier over time. Because I also had some water flow issues in our yard, I rented a small excavator for the weekend and contoured the area the way I needed it to be and made the ground as smooth as possible before installing the weed barrier. Okay, so here's where I made my first mistake. Before you install a weed barrier, you want to make the ground as smooth as possible and remove all sharp stones and sticks, especially any dried knotweed canes because they are super hard and sharp and will poke through the weed barrier. I did all of that here and this area was pretty smooth. But what you should also do is put down a layer of thick cardboard or three to four inches of wood chips before putting down the weed barrier to further protect the weed barrier from getting punctured. I didn't do that, mainly because this area was so large, but in hindsight, it definitely would have been worth my time to do so and could have removed an entire year of work to get this knotweed under control. All right, so after I got this area as smooth as I could, I rolled out over the entire area the best professional weed barrier I could find making sure to overlap the edges of each course by at least two feet. And I used long landscaping staples to secure the seams. The weed barrier was in five foot by 200 foot rolls. So I just rolled it out in long strips. Here, I took a chance and drove the metal T posts for the property fence through the weed barrier. As of fall 2020, the knotweed has not come up through these post holes. I extended the weed barrier out at least two feet beyond where any knotweed grew. And as of fall 2020, the knotweed has not crept out the edges. I couldn't bear to cut an apple tree or a beautiful autumn olive shrub that was growing in this area. So I just wrapped the weed barrier around the base of these two plants. As of fall 2020, the area around the autumn olive is completely knotweed free but I still have a few small weak stems of knotweed that occasionally creep up along the trunk of the apple tree. Here's the weed barrier fully installed and ready to have mulch added on top. The total cost of the weed barrier was $1,500. One very important aspect about this design is that it is intended to be a permanent installation. The intent is to never remove this weed barrier. Most recommendations for smothering knotweed suggest keeping the weed barrier in place for at least five years. And that may be fine for a small area of knotweed that isn't really well established. But research from the UK suggests that well-established knotweed with large extensive rhizomes can respond to smothering by going dormant for as many as 10 years and reemerge once they are uncovered. So the plan here is to leave this weed barrier in place and to continually add material on top to build soil on top of the weed barrier over time. 
I began by adding a four to six inch layer of composted manure just in an area where I plan to construct a high tunnel greenhouse. And I then covered the entire weed barrier with wood chips that I was able to get for free from a local arborist. So here's the trusty garden cart I used to move the chips from my front yard to my backyard. I had to use this garden cart because I couldn't get a tractor to the back of the house and I definitely wouldn't have wanted to drive equipment on the weed barrier. I moved hundreds of cartloads of chips in October 2018. 75 cartloads was my record number of loads in one day. This was a huge amount of work and I believe this project probably would not have been very practical for most landowners. This project also wouldn't have been practical if I didn't have free access to all the wood chips I needed. All right, so here's where I made my second biggest mistake. So after putting down the mulch for the hoop house, I then started to add mulch at the far end and I worked my way back. I did this primarily because it was really difficult to push a full cartload of chips through six or more inches of chips I had already laid down. This meant I was walking and rolling heavy cartloads of chips repeatedly over the bare weed barrier and that this created tiny minuscule punctures in the fabric that the knotweed was able to grow up through in many areas. So if possible, avoid or at least minimize how much you walk on top of the bare weed barrier. This problem probably would have been minimized or avoided if I had put down the layer of mulch or cardboard under the weed barrier. It was definitely not apparent I was making holes in the weed barrier by walking over it. In October 2018, I covered all areas of the weed barrier with at least six to eight inches of wood chips. And I immediately constructed a 14 by 23 foot high tunnel hoop house directly on top of the weed barrier and mulch. This photo shows the series of metal poles that serve as anchors and support for each hoop of the hoop house. I drove these posts at least four feet into the ground directly through the weed barrier. As of fall 2020, only a few small weak stems of knotweed occasionally pop up within and just outside of the hoop house near the anchors I indicate with white arrows. I simply keep an eye on these areas and pull up any knotweed stems whenever they emerge, which is about once every week or two. So again, the idea here is to build up a progressively deep layer of mulch over the top of the weed barrier and to just allow that mulch to compost in place to form fertile soil over time. This approach is basically the back to Eden gardening method which is a technique pioneered or at least made popular by Paul Gauchy in Washington State. Paul is quite a character and he has a great video about this method online. I encourage you to watch it. So that's basically where I got the idea to do this. So in any areas where you want to plant new plants, you can't dig through the weed barrier and the roots of the new plants won't go through the weed barrier. So you just need to add a deep enough layer of mulch to accommodate the plants you want to grow. So I immediately added additional mulch inside the hoop house as I was constructing it. In the first winter, we overwintered a flock of 12 laying hens in the hoop house. Each week, I added about a half a bale of hay and all our kitchen compost into the hoop house, and the chickens did a great job of incorporating this organic material into the wood chips. So far, the hoop house has performed wonderfully for us, and we've grown a wide variety of amazing crops in the hoop house, in the mulch on top of the weed barrier. During the first growing season, my error of not putting a layer of wood chips beneath the weed barrier and my error of rolling carts of wood chips over the bare weed barrier became readily apparent as knotweed stems started sprouting up in many areas of the wood chips outside of the hoop house. I carefully pulled back the chips around each sprout and found the knotweed was coming up through imperceptibly small holes I had created. I suggest that it's incredibly important to address any sprouting immediately to keep the knotweed from sending rhizomes through the wood chips on top of the weed barrier. So whenever I found sprouts emerging, I carefully cleared away the chips, pulled the sprouts, put a patch of weed barrier over the area 
and then covered the area over again with wood chips. When patching these areas, I found that it is important to make sure that the patch extends at least a couple feet beyond where the sprouts emerge. I had to patch this area in the photo twice because the sprouts crept underneath and emerged through the edge of my first patch that wasn't big enough. I had to repatch a few rather large areas, but by the end of the 2019 growing season, the knotweed was totally under control, except for the few sprouts near the apple tree and the edge of the hoop house. So overall, I feel this approach was super successful for controlling this decently large knotweed invasion. That said, I want to stress that this project would have failed if I had installed the weed barrier, covered it with chips, and then walked away without monitoring the site in 2019, and if I didn't immediately patch or pull all of the areas that sprouted. Sprouts continued to emerge in new areas throughout the 2019 growing season. It required an entire growing season of monitoring to get the knotweed completely under control, but no new sprouts emerged in 2020. At the end of the 2019 growing season, I made a number of raised garden beds in this area that was once totally dominated by a monoculture of knotweed. I first put down a six inch layer of wood chips along a path for the garden cart, and then I created the beds by mounding compost one and a half to two feet deep. I then covered these compost mounds with about three inches of wood chips and allowed the mounds to fully compost in place over winter. In 2020, these raised beds produced literally hundreds of pounds of sugar pumpkins, butternut squash, buttercup squash, watermelons, and cherry tomatoes. The yellow arrows point to two miniature crab apple trees that are planted in the deepest raised beds. So at the end of 2020, I left all of the vegetable plants in place and I covered all of the beds with another six inches of wood chips. The white arrows indicate new beds I created just using wood chips, no compost. This entire area that you see was totally dominated by a dense monoculture of knotweed in 2017. Three years later, knotweed has been completely eradicated from this area, except for a few very weak stems that continue to emerge by the apple tree and near the edge of the hoop house. I continue to just pull these few sprouts out because I don't want to use herbicide. This area should still be monitored regularly to make sure knotweed doesn't emerge in any new areas, and if it does, it should be patched immediately. By the end of the third growing season, this area is a blank slate that is completely ready for planting a combination of annual and perennial vegetables and flowers, and even fruiting shrubs and vines. Thanks for watching this knotweed control case study. Please don't hesitate to contact me if you have any questions or want more details about this specific project.